Yeah, 400 quid if you lose some weight. Uh, Roy, very good morning to you. What do you reckon? Good morning, Mike. Well, men, obese men are what's called a hard-to-reach group. Yeah. They are... Um, well, surely you just put out a, set of, a stand with a load of donuts on it and then you bring them all to, yeah. bring them all to, the, to the party. Yeah, and, and I was saying to producer before I came on, for 400 quid, I'll put on some weight and see if I can <laughs> win some money. Well, do you know, so, you say that in jest, but some people might do it. You never know. This is the world's bonkers, isn't it? It is. Uh, anyway, listen, to, to try and answer your impossible question, <laughs> they, they are a hard-to-reach group. Getting men on, on weight loss programmes is very difficult. I mean, you know, working men particularly, it's quite difficult mm. to reach them. There's a wonderful picture there. That, is that me on the way to work? <laughs> no. But so there is a there is a difficulty in doing it, and obesity is the biggest cause um, of the biggest avoidable cause of cancer. It's the biggest avoidable cause of uh, heart disease, blood pressure, and stroke. It really is a killer, and so we do have to bring obesity levels down. Of course, yesterday there was some good news. A couple of uh, weight loss drugs were found to have an impact on cardiovascular disease as well. Right. So it's likely the NHS will be losing that. But I mean. Uh, if you think about strokes, I think yeah, you know they're costing us uh, three or four billion a year, four, three point four billion a year. It is, I think, heart, heart attacks are costing us something like seven billion. So anything we can do to bring obesity down, which is the root cause of the problem, it's worth having a go. It's a gimmick, but hey, you know, you know, yeah. it might work. But of course, there are people who would say, yeah, but hang on, why should the people who are not in, ne in, in necessary sort of need of assistance from the NHS be funding? people who don't uh, sort of give a damn um, because an awful lot of people yeah. who are obese are obese because they're obese you know they haven't they haven't done anything to not become obese they eat too much they don't exercise enough um, and therefore it's partly their own mark largely their own fault isn't it why should yeah, well, why should the state I mean, be subsidizing them to lose weight it, it is quite interesting obesity now has become a kind of a lifestyle issue across the whole of the developed world it was in 2013 actually that the american medical association defined obesity as a disease right. it did that to enable american insurance health insurance companies to pay the cost of obesity yeah. because and some of the insurance companies were saying, oh, you're obese, you've got heart failure because you're obese, we won't pay your medical bills. Yeah. So change that. The World Health Organization now regard it as a global disease. So it is regarded as a disease. Certainly, I mean, there are lifestyle issues. I mean, anyone that goes to Starbucks and has a full fat latte and a chocolate muffin and not realise they've had enough calories to keep the English rugby team going for a fortnight, well, you know, there's not much help for right. them. But I mean, if some, if some doctor, imagine if some doctor popped up and said, look, here's an incentive for you. I'm going to give you 100 quid right now. Uh, if you can walk for the next uh, seven days, you know, I don't know, three miles a day. And, you know, that would be a weird yeah. thing to do. It might they even work. No, no, it no, might, Mike, it might even work. But, you know, the money's got to come from somewhere. Yeah, it's not it's not weird, Mike. The um, I mean, they've actually tried that with Fitbits. They've mm. given people Fitbits to count their steps and so yeah, on. But we're get... paying for those as well. Yes, but you see, on the other side of the coin, you have to say, well, what is the cost of the outcome of obesity? Uh, and yes, you can say, OK, well, we could have a prolonged public health campaign. That would cost money as well. Here's the dichotomy. The, the problem I always have, what is the purpose of the NHS? Is the purpose of the NHS to sort out people when they get sick? Yes. Or is the purpose of the NHS to stop people getting sick in the first place? If I don't think it is, because it's... the problem with doing that is that people live longer. Uh, we've already seen that people are living longer than they ever were, costing even more money to the NHS. That's it's a lot true. more efficient. It's a lot more actually financially viable for the NHS to let people live their lives as they wish. And if it happens to end up in a heart attack or some kind of you know stroke which, which leaves them uh, prematurely dead, then they won't be a drain on the NHS, will they? Well, it's true. If we all croak it early, the NHS will be a lot better well, off. Well, we don't all have to, but what I'm saying is, is why do you have to stop the people who are determined to die early because well, they want to live it, that way? Listen, why, should we, is, why should we spend our money to save them? This is the role of public health. And public health was taken away from the NHS and given to local authorities in 2012 when Andrew Lansley was the Secretary of State for Health. 
Public health has never really recovered from that. And, and, I, and I, you know, does society, not just the NHS, but does society have a role in persuading us to lead healthier lives, keeping us healthy? I don't think it does. I really don't. I think people have a right to do whatever they want. If they want to be overweight, if they want to do dangerous drugs, if they want to risk being arrested for, for doing things which are illegal, if they want to drink too much and get their liver screwed up, you know, generally speaking, I think we live in a democracy in which you should be allowed to do that, surely? Well, it's a, it's a complex complicated rabbit hole to go down i tell you if there was a debate i was involved in a debate some years ago now where they were saying well people if people do drugs or they do harmful things they should pay for their health care so then yeah, i said what, okay, we do? what about what about the guy that plays squash three times a week right. and, and, and ruptures his achilles tendon playing squash should he pay for, for the repair to his Achilles tendon. And of course, you get into it, you know, don't go there. It's too complicated. No, I, no, I, I, go to, I always go there, Roy, because it's what I do. But here's the point. The bottom line is, is that, of course, we all pay. We already do. You know, this is the same argument I have with people all the time. Well, the great thing about the NHS is it's free. It's not free. You know, 25% of my income tax goes to the NHS, and I pay quite a lot of it, and so do quite a lot of other people. And so, uh, in fact, but when I when I go to use the NHS, it's not really available to me, so I may go private, in which case that's doing the NHS a favour. You know what I mean? There's all sorts of swings and roundabouts, and I think, you know, you don't offer people money not to commit crime, so why would you it's offer people money not to eat donuts? Well, I mean, we, you were talking earlier, your interesting conversation with the guy about knife crime. Yeah. Uh, he was talking about knife crime. In, in in a sense, he was talking about not paying kids not to carry knives, but but putting things in place to distract them from the attraction of yes. carrying. You know that comes with a cost as well. Everything comes with a cost. Then we get into the very deep philosophical question about what is the role of society. Hmm. And I, think, and I think, I mean, I take your point, and it's a very valid one. I disagree with you, though, because I think the role of society, and unfortunately we've seen this ever since COVID, it's got worse, that the government would love to be able to give you instructions on how to live your life from the minute you wake up in the morning to what you should eat, where you should go, how you should get there. You know, you, will, you put on the, the Transport for London app now, the first thing it tells you is how to walk to where you want to go. You know, we've been doing a story this morning about a Cambridge roundabout, which is designed to dissuade people from driving. You know, I'm not interested in living in a country where I'm being told what to do every bloody minute of the day, thanks. Uh, well, I'm quite sure the viewers and listeners are going to block up your lines with their thoughts <laughs> about it as well. But, uh, yeah, you are. it's a very interesting topic. And, you know, where does the state begin and where does it end? Right. Um, and that's above my pay grade, I think. OK. Well, let's do something that's not above your pay grade. Boris Johnson uh, from 2019 said this. What we're committing to is a programme of 40 new hospitals, starting with six. Uh, you're absolutely right. But uh, this one here in North Manchester General Hospital, it's a fantastic institution. Uh, talking to the doctors, the nurses, the staff, they're doing an amazing job. But they're doing it in buildings that were built in 1870. So that is a plan that will cost, I think, about 500 million. Uh, we're embarking on that plan now. We're giving the go-ahead. To now, to see, this to me, Roy, is what the NHS should be doing and what the government should be doing. You know, build more hospitals, make the facilities better for people so that they can access them and they can use them when they want. Boris Johnson's hair was very short there. Takes you back, doesn't it? Um, I don't know what the state is. Be before COVID, we could still all go to the barbers. Yeah, yeah well, exactly right. Uh, now, that uh, 40 new hospital programme, which, as he rather blithely said, was started with six, um, has now apparently been beset by delay and indecision. Very it's, much like was, an awful lot of stuff in the NHS. It was always beset. I remember when he first made that announcement, he made it on the steps of Downing Street, if you remember. He stood at the lectern and yeah. said what he was going to do. And, and when he said he was going to build 40 new hospitals, I, I mean, I stopped and I thought, what have I missed here? Yeah. Um, you know, have I missed a policy document? Have I So I had a ring round, you know, the people that I'm um, in contact with the NHS, and they said, we, don't know, we had no idea. Nobody had any idea. No one, not in the Department of Health, NHS England, and in the hospitals, none of them had any idea that he was going to make that announcement. Now, as it turned out, eight of the hospitals were already uh, underway. Since then, seven have been added because they're falling down. Mm. The so-called rack hospitals, the air 80 concrete. Oh, yeah. 
that's being propped up by scaffolding. And, of course, the rest of it is beset with all kinds of problems. The person leading... Well, first of all, the, the 40 hospital programme was a standalone unit in the Department of Health. Mm. It was then merged into NHS England. The person running it is leaving, and they've had umpteen goes at trying to replace the person running it, and they can't find anybody to do it. And the, this is a wider issue in the construction industry, and I'm sure you know viewers and listeners will, will tell you about this from their own experience. But the construction industry... Is it's chock-a-block. It's, it's plagued with short supply. I mean, I know it's a, um, a silly thing to say, but you can't buy scaffold boards these days because really? they come in from Germany and they're, they're really expensive. A lot of the construction industry was staffed by people from Europe. They've gone back. They, you know, they, they can't work here anymore. The construction industry is having a really difficult time with the building programmes and the NHS has had a terrible trouble getting this off the ground not only that if you want to build a new hospital you've got all the problems with with the design the planning the the acquisition of the land i mean it's a very complex thing and to do it in 10 years you know 40 in 10 years it was just bonkers well have no, they built any no one yes they've got they got there were some were underway already that was subsumed right. into the and I think one or two have been been open. But as far as the main thrust of the policy is concerned, it isn't going to happen. And somehow or other, the Tories have got to find their way out of this because at the moment they're hung on, you know, where's the 40 new hospitals? Can't see, you know, everybody's looking for the new hospitals, can't see the hospitals anywhere. And so they've got to find a way out of this. They're, I mean, the money... Well, I think an election's the way out of it, isn't it? Well, I mean, the, yes, I guess it is. But then, then the question then is, you know, what, uh, what's Keir Starmer going to well, do? Well, that's the, a big question. Husband? That is you a know, very big he, question. Can he count for up to 40? You yeah. know, perhaps he can't. I, I don't, don't think know. he can. Uh, but we'll see. Roy, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Always a job. Roy Lilly there, former NHS Trust Chairman, Health Policy Analyst. That's